Please patronize our sponsors who support the Guild and our mission to educate members and non-members to enjoy and enrich their woodworking skills and experiences. You pick hardwood lumber, Rockler Woodworking and Hardware, and the W.D. Quinn Saw Company. So I am Jay Knopfsinger. Most of you know me, but for those of you who don't, I am the current president of the, this wonderful organization, St. Louis Woodworkers Guild. Uh, and I want to welcome you to the uh, March um, uh, presentation and Mark, March uh, at a members meeting that you all come to instead of our um, um, Zoom kind of meetings and so on, right? in, in person and so on. So go ahead. Uh, so for those of you who haven't been here before or don't know, uh, there are a couple things that we're going to be doing just before the presentation itself. Several members who have worked hard on some projects have brought them in for us, for, for you all to be able to see. And so they, at the very end of the meeting, just before the presentation, uh, they will one by one um, be coming up and showing you what they have to present to you. And you can ask questions. If you ask questions at any time during any part of the presentation, we want you to do it into a microphone. And the reason for that is how Donovan, Donovan is actually recording this and making it available for those people who want to look at it later. And he can't hear anybody if, if you aren't using a microphone if they're doing it that way then. So, so now's the time for uh, any new members or just visitors to introduce themselves. Well, thank you. Thanks for having me. But um, my name's Trent. Um, I've been, I've heard about the Guild for a while now, I just never came, but I was at Rockler the other day and had a question for them about a uh, new whittle and knife that I just bought online, um, and they weren't able to help me with that, and they sent me your flyer and sent me over here. So, um, so yeah, mostly I just whittle, um, you know, I do, I'd like to do furniture and stuff like that, but I'm limited on space to do it right now, so, but that's me. No. Yeah, I hear tell. <laughs> Uh, so we, I don't see our master turner and whittler and uh, carver here today. I, don't, I haven't seen them at least. But I understand there's going to be a, excuse me, I understand there's going to be a carver's uh, show at the Belleville Fairgrounds in the fall, September, October. I can't remember exactly the date on it. Uh, so apologize for that, but I'm sure you, you'll want to know about it. Excuse it's me? Like the first weekend in November. November? Yeah. Okay. Maybe, maybe. Okay. I've been there <laughs> one time. Uh, all right. Thank you very much and welcome, though. And is this uh, Trent? Yeah. Just take, say your name and tell Jim us. Jim Saulwasser. Okay. Um, I recently retired. Um, kind of in small stuff like bandsaw boxes and, you know, I've done furniture in the past, but haven't done it for a long time. So that's kind of where I'm at. I've heard about this group. I knew you, I went to great high school, or junior high here. I knew you guys had a shop here at one point, but I guess you moved over to uh, Falls Park now. Yeah. Um, okay. So where was it you are saying before that you remember? I want to remember. I went to, I went to junior high here. Okay. In this building. <laughs> oh, in this building? Yes. <laughs> no kidding. Wonderful. Well, when you're coming a, back when home. It was a park by junior high. Yeah. So. Uh, well, that I very much or welcome welcome you and, and any any questions you have about any form of woodworking, I think there are probably people here that could answer that. So Thank you. Answer those for you, though. Okay. I retired uh, about six years ago and. I had a friend who had a wood shop in his basement, and uh, uh, near the end of my retirement, I'd, I'd always visit him, and, and I was—I had wood shop envy. So, <laughs> after I retired, I started accumulating equipment, and it took me a couple of years to build the shop. And then after I built the shop, I had to learn how to use the tools. <laughs> so it's been—it's <clears throat> been a long, drawn-out process. But my friend Ron here, who's a member. Uh, We've been talking about some of the projects that we do uh, at home, and he invited me here, and 
here I am, so thanks for having me. Thanks, Ron, for inviting us. So, so welcome. So, any more that I'm missing? New or just visitors? Okay, next, next one. So Bill Shukat, um, I think you probably have some other slides that are going to talk about some upcoming classes and presentations um, for, uh, for you to choose from. Thank you. Okay, upcoming presentations. Um, this month we're going to have a presentation on marquetry. Um, April, there is no presentation um, because of the election. The meeting runs too long. Uh, May um, is a presentation on building a bedroom set, mission style. I mean, everything got goofed up there. It's supposed to be mission style inspired. Uh, June 18. By, by Dan Lender. By Dan Lender. Uh, June 18, uh, we're going to have a presentation on Christmas gift ideas. We have a sign-up sheet um, by the front desk. Uh, if you have any suggestions, it's not going to take any um, preparation, but if you have some ideas that other people might be interested in for Christmas gifts, um, please sign up. Um, in July, there's a similar kind of project. Uh, if you have any jigs that you think it might be of interest to other people in the guild, um, plan on bringing those and talking about it for 30 seconds or more. Christmas uh, ideas, uh, samples would be great. Photos would work instead. If you have drawings or sketches, uh, if other people are interested in that, let them know that you have that available. Um, the jig demonstrations, uh, same thing. Samples, photos, drawings, sketches, et cetera. The sign-up sheets for both, it's actually one sign-up sheet in two parts uh, at the front desk. Upcoming classes in March. Um, this weekend we have a beginner scroll sawing class. Next. April, um, some more fundamentals classes. There is a class on spray finishing, lacquer and shellac. Uh, only one space remains in that, so if you're interested, you go ahead and sign up. Go back. You jumped on me. Oh, it's another fundamentals class. Go to May next month. Um, we're going to have a, a class on making through dovetails and half line dovetails. That should be interested in anybody who's interested in dovetail construction. And we're going to have the beginner's woodworking class, um, which is for people that are not familiar with the equipment in the shop, um, another version of that. Do we have another slide? There's some other upcoming topics. Um, we're going to have an introduction to carving later in the year. I don't ha have a date for that in front of me. Um, there's another class on cutting boards, uh, a class on making mortise and tenon joints, um, building a small box. We're going to have a class on making a mantle clock uh, with a bent top, that, a two-day class. You sign up for uh, the first day and you're automatically signed up for the second. There's an introduction to hand, there's several hand plane classes coming up. Inter, introduction to hand planes, tuning up and using hand planes, and something that's called hand planed appliances like a shooting board. Uh, we're also going to have a class on federal style inlays uh, and banding, and that is a two day class that Mike Sistek is going to put on. Um, we now have the shorty classes scheduled. Um, if you're new and, and aren't comfortable with all the equipment we have in our shop, we have a one-hour session before open shop times on Saturday morning. Uh, on these dates, for router table, drill press, table saw, band saw, hand planes, and planer joiner. You can learn a lot about using that equipment 
feel more comfortable using it. What's next? We have the picnic coming up uh, in September, and we are looking for a volunteer to head up that effort. Um, I did it the last couple of years, and I'd be happy to show you how to take care of it. David, can I you can you can do it right now. Okay, thank you, thank you, Jay. Uh, my name is David Gronefeld. I'm uh, the shop manager, and I also work at Faust Park. And uh, we have several things going on at Faust Park that I wanted to make sure everyone was aware of. As I've mentioned at the past meetings, there is the I believe it's being called the Whimsical Woods, and I want to thank all the members that have already contributed to making some uh, gnome homes or fairies or uh, butterflies. We've already received quite a few things from guild members, and uh, we thank you very much. Don, thank you, and your wife, Linda, for the great uh, uh, work that she's done. Well, everyone is very, very impressed with, with her work. Uh, and in that vein, in association with this, in August we have an art fair, and a, the, the guild will have a booth at the art fair that the, since we are donating these things to the, uh, to the uh, uh, Whimsical Woods, the, par the park is donating a couple of booths for the guild to utilize to sell things at the art fair. And the idea is that members would donate some things to the guild that would be then sold for the benefit of the guild. Also, if guild members wanted to sell their own wares, they would need to rent a booth. I think it's... $25 or it's under 50 I don't remember exactly what it is uh, but uh, they could do that and so far we have had over 40 people 40 uh, entities rent boots so there's only about 15 left so this is happening and it does seem to be a popular event and it's going to be it seems like it's going to be uh, if not well attended at least well populated with with uh, with uh, artists, uh, there's also uh, and by the way, your wife has been mentioned as a possible candidate for a booth uh, that that could sell her wares. Uh, in that in in that vein, uh, even like Bill Shukat has made a a. Uh, Oh, okay, okay. Well, uh, it's my understanding that, that someone else wanted one of those as well. So once, they seem to be popular. Uh, thank you. There's also one other event that the park is hosting, and that is a, it started out as a wine tasting, but it's kind of morphed into another uh, booth selling and beer tasting, wine tasting event. And that's going to be on Mother's Day weekend. If anyone is interested in renting a booth at that event, there are booths available at that event as well. Uh, so those couple events are coming up. And again, thanks for everybody that's uh, already given some things to help populate our Whimsical Woods. Thanks. Thank you, David. Um, so Faust Park is a, a wonderful partner that we have. So we really do want to support them in every way we possibly can. Uh, is anybody back there ready to speak for the toy committee? Okay, and I don't know how many were turned in tonight, but quite a few. Yes. I think Paul Deutsch gave you about a thousand of them right in that big box back there. <laughs> no, but several, several more. We had uh, close to 200 toys tonight. Amaz amazing, though. Okay, for those of you who don't know, I don't know the exact number now, but I think we're up to uh, something like 87,000 toys that have been distributed to the uh, children's hospitals and so on over the course of since about 1985, 84 or 85 or something like that. Uh, okay, next slide. And then Wayne uh, Humphrey uh, um, mentors the uh, Christmas toy program and he might have a few words to say. 
We build toys out at the uh, shop the first and third Fridays of the month uh, from 10 to 2. And you're welcome to come out and help us out. If you want to build toys at home uh, for Christmas distribution, uh, let me know. We can come up with some uh, plans for you. And we've got about 250 in inventory already and uh, probably another couple of hundred in work in progress right now. So. And anybody can just show up, right? Sure. They don't have to call you or anything. So, <laughs> All right. Uh, build a table. I, th I saw Tom here. Where's Tom turning? There you go. Right here. Uh, yes, the uh, build a table program uh, has succeeded, met our goal for the year. We had a goal of 110 small tables for Home Sweet Home. Uh, we've built and delivered 116 tables. So that's excellent. That's uh, two, 218 tables over the course of the program, the two year program. We're we're out of wood right now in the shed. Uh, we uh, had a work day in the shop. We processed about 250 board feet of uh, red oak. We assembled 18 uh, kits for table builders. Those have been handed out, and we've gotten about eight of those back. So uh, the, the program, uh, two weeks, I think, we'll pick up some more wood and probably have another uh, work day. Actually, it was two work days in the shop. So. Uh, it was it was good. It was fun uh, for the folks. We had 10 or 12 folks show up each day, so we had a good time, and we got a lot of work done. So thank you all, the participants, and if you're interested in the program, it's a great program. You want to get involved, uh, just see me. I'm happy to uh, talk about it. So I'm thank not you. quite out, out of my Red Oak yet supply. So yeah, well. thank goodness. <laughs> Thanks, Jake. Okay. Uh, Dan, you want to give a little br a brief summary, uh, kind of a wrap up of the wonderful, wonderful Superstar Weekend that we had uh, very recently. Doc? I wasn't prepared for this. That's okay. That's all right. So thanks er to everyone that attended this year's Superstar Weekend with Logan Whitmer, the chief and editor from Poplar Woodworking. I guess I can say it was a big success with your attendance there. We had, uh, we had 49 people register and we had 48 attend, so that was huge. So thank you. I think we had a great time, and uh, I'm working on next year. So I got a list already. But if you, if you have a your poplar woodworker that you would like to perhaps be a part of our next year's event, you can send me an email. So thanks again. Thanks, Dan. Yeah. So I only put it up there so I could praise Dan himself uh, for the uh, incredible. Uh, job he did in organizing it just he, he works on this thing for a whole year he really does and I can also have this opportunity to announce he has graciously accepted the role of doing the same thing for this coming year as well so it's great uh, the feasibility study for a possible new shop um, we have done multiple things and no way am I going to sit here and tell you that in my year of being president we're going to be we're ready to build a shop or whatever but we have a lot of data that we've collected that's why I wanted from the beginning to call this a feasibility study uh, so just in the last month or so a little more than a month um, the one place that I think would have been quite conducive to us having a, a lease arrangement and so on was, would have been with Quinsaw they are our incredible uh, suppliers of, of uh, start sharpening our, our, uh, our, our um, blades and so on. And they happen to have 4,800 extra square feet. We, a group of us, I think there was about five or six or seven people that went. And it would, it would be incredible. It would be a perfect place for us. Uh, the, kind of across the highway from the um, airport, it's about where it was, in St. Anne. But, it's for lease. The lease is $12 a square foot. You add that up with 12, with uh, 4,800 square feet, and it would be something in the order of $57,000 a year for, for the lease. And there's no way that we could even talk about that. It would be quite a while in the future for us to do that. So that's probably not going to be what we end up doing, but that was the one that would have been the best. There's no way we would ever find more uh, perfect uh, landlords. <laughs> They want us there. They really would like to, us there. They're really great people to work with. 
Um, then um, Bob Castigar went and looked at um, the um, maker's space uh, set up, what they have and so on. Uh, there's Bob. And uh, he, he um, found, I think, that they do not have more space or more woodworking tools than we already have, pretty much. Isn't that about right? Uh, they do have electronic things. They have uh, CNC machines. They have big equipment in that kind of area that we do not have, um, nor do we have space for it anyway at this point. So we haven't closed the door for working with them, some kind of agreement where maybe we could talk about uh, letting our people do, use their equipment and vice versa and so on. Uh, there may be something to, to work out, but it's not going to end up, I don't think, being a place where we're going to have um, a new shop kind of hooked together with them and so on. Most recently, in fact, just tonight, we, uh, Bill Shukat and I uh, were talking about the possibility of building uh, a new shop right in Faust Park. I told you how uh, important I think it is for us to continue the relationship we have with the people at Faust Park. And this is at least the most achievable kind of thing in the future. We're still I'm not really ready to give you um, final results of that, uh, but we're talking about some uh, a pole barn kind of construction, but it would look like uh, probably uh, outside metal, you know, walls and everything like that, and a concrete floor, and something maybe more on the order to begin with, with uh, maybe 2,500 square feet or so. We currently have 1,500 or so square feet, uh, with the possibility of expanding that, just adding on to it, the footprint and so on, to make it at some point, uh, maybe it could be up to 5,000 square feet. Uh, but it'd be very different. It's not would not be a lease. It would be us building the building and so on. Um, and we're got, we still need to look into things like would they allow us to do some of the at least interior construction and stuff like that, which would save a lot of money. So we're not. It's not going to happen. Probably not this year even and so on. But I'm at least more optimistic myself that that kind of thing is at least more achieva achievable and not in the you know not the in the, in the not the terribly distant future and so on. So we'll kind of see. Craig Altman uh, got in touch with me again. He had done it by email but, and stuff before, so he talked about it. But he is uh, now in charge of the toy build program. So I'm going to let him explain to you um, this wonderful program and hopefully get some more people to help out, though. I'm uh, spearheading the Westbridge School toy build program. And for those of you that aren't familiar with it, on May 22nd, those that are interested, we're going to take a field trip to Westbridge Elementary School and we're gonna work with the fifth grade class there. And there's 80 kids in the class and the, build is, the guild is gonna provide 80 toy kits that the kids can build and assemble and the kits eventually get donated to kids in the hospital. So at this point, um, I'm hoping to get some support and have uh, some of the guild members um, step forward and be interested in building the kits. Uh, this year we're building um, Oh, like a Model T car, uh, a fighter jet, a Jeep. Um, most of these toys can be built out of a, a two by four. I've got all the, you know, the dowels and the wheels. And um, I went out there last year. Bill started the program and ran it last year. And I volunteered, went out to the school, worked with the fifth graders. It was well received. The kids had a good time. And I think it's a really good outreach program for the guild. And, and quite frankly, based on the level of support I get, I would like to, in the fall, maybe go to a school that kids are a little bit underprivileged and wouldn't have the opportunity to uh, experience woodworking. And, um, but again, all of that is dependent on uh, if people are interested in, in helping out. And um, so I'm going to stick around after the meeting, and anybody has any questions, I can certainly go over the program with you. Or if you have any ideas to maybe make the program run a little bit smoother, um, I'm all for any ideas anybody has. Yeah, Tom. It's in the Parkway School District, and the school is, it's out in Baldwin. Oh, it's Rockwood. I'm sorry. It's Rockwood. And what I was going to do, one of the ideas I had is once the fifth graders finish up their toy, I was going to have them write just a little handwritten note to kind of personalize it. Hey, my name's Johnny. My favorite sport is football. 
Uh, when I grow up, I, I want to be an attorney and, and, uh, or a master woodworker. Um, and uh, so the kid who receives it also, it's just a little bit more personal, and, and I think um, both kids would get something a little bit more out of it. I think it's a rewarding program for everyone involved. So I'll stick around afterwards if anyone has, anyone has any questions. Thank you. Thank you, Craig. And Craig, I, I think you see that we have a whole lot of experience building toys. There's no question about that. <laughs> so anybody who can, um, please, please uh, sign up. And thank you for coming, and thank you for staying around at the end of the meeting then, too. OK, the Woodworker Show. Uh, we did somehow put together a booth um, with less than three weeks notice of there being a show here and so on. So I thought uh, we did a remarkable job of doing that and, and having our presence there. I think those of us who were there and at our own booth, I'm not going to make any comments about the success of the, the whole show. Uh, I, it is clearly, it was the smallest one that I've ever been to and so on. Um, somebody told me that the two shows after ours were even canceled because they kind of saw that things were, that the vendors were kind of dropping out because they, they weren't as happy about the number of people showing up. Uh, I wanted to, show, to say a uh, personal thank you to Andrea Lyons, who did agree to be the person in charge of signing people up, those of you who volunteered to man the booth and just be there at maybe three hour periods or something like that um, during the three days that we had the show. Um, I, th I think, I'm not positive, I mean, we, we may have lost some of them by not following up quick enough and so on, but I think w we probably gained about five or six, about a half dozen new members, which is one of our goals of going to a place like that uh, during this time. Uh, one of them that I haven't heard, that he wasn't here as a guest tonight, but he's from um, uh, Herman. So I, have, I gave information about him to Joe to give to Matt, by the way, that to be, get a hold of him and so on. So, um, and there was another person that I don't know whether he's one that already signed up or not, but he is, I was shocked, but also uh, happy to hear. He introduced himself as being from uh, uh, a industrial arts teacher at a middle school in St. Jacob, Illinois, which is a little tiny town <laughs> uh, close to where the show was and so on, close to where I live. Wow, I, d I thought they'd, they, they got rid of it in all the high schools and so on. So no, he's an industrial arts, and he wanted to do, learn. I, he wanted to join the uh, the guild right then and there, uh, and I don't know what happened uh, about that. And I didn't get his name, so I don't have his follow up information. So if you find him, he would be listed his address as Illinois. He might live in not in St. Jacob, but in one of the surrounding little communities. So if you found anybody that sounded like that, it, that would be him. Um, so um, the uh, lack of the, what do we call them, the great big thing, heavy, the panels, <laughs> the huge panels that are very heavy and so on, we didn't miss them at all, I don't think. So I think we uh, had a good presence. I think we had a lot of interested people. We were right beside the Edwardsville woodworkers, which is kind of nice to be able to kind of talk to each other there as well too. Next year, they, I've got their act together, I think, and they are going to have the show again, which I'm really happy about, Metro East. This time it's going to be in the Belleville, um, Belleville uh, fair, Fairgrounds again, where the, where the Turners or the Carvers uh, are going to have their meeting and so on. And now the city owns that, and they're going to be kind of revamping the whole building and so on. At least they say they are. So that's, that's for next year. There's already a tentative date and so on. Okay, next one. Um, I, uh, Mike Sistek gave me the name of uh, a, still a current member of, the, of our guild, um, who he got to know while well, they were both still active duty, I think, at Scott, right? And then after that, contract working and so on. Uh, he, he lives in, in Aviston, uh, Illinois, which is a nice little town that I even know all about it and where it is and everything, so living over in that direction. So I went and visited them, him and his wife um, own and, um, and work with this shop and so on. And, and so that's where we got them in the past. Nobody mentioned anything about wanting aprons and hats until the last month and a half, maybe related to the show or something, I don't know. 
but there seemed to be some excitement. So at least I got information. I have some things to, for you to start passing around. Um, and one of the new things that they have that they didn't have uh, the last time we got them is the ability to in-house use uh, something called leatherette to actually uh, replace embroidery with a significant savings. Um, and it doesn't matter whether you put it on a hat, and I'll, I'll pass the hat around with one of those actually put on there. I'll, the actual patch, which could be any size you want it, because they already have the model and everything. So they, if they did it for the apron, it would be like four inches wide or something. It'd be a lot bigger than that. So, uh, so that's called a leatherette patch. They can make them in-house. So late, like for hats, for caps, you could literally have an individual order and say, I want a blue one, I want a chartreuse one, or whatever, and have them make it just, you know, individually because they do it in-house. You can't do that for the embroidery. So I'm, I just want to, I guess what, I, you haven't seen these yet, yet or not, you, you see the pictures. How many people in this room think that they would be willing to or want to purchase an apron or a hat or both or any other kind of device? Hey, that's... <laughs> Good. <laughs> so anyway, uh, so I'm, uh, but I want some idea. I want you to give me ideas back about colors. I think uh, our old ones were, I think, were khaki or this tan like this. That's why I put that down as a picture to, to do to begin with. I think Vicky said no, they ought to be denim. denim. <laughs> but whatever. Uh, but give me give me some ideas, and then I'll maybe go ahead. And then the question is, putting forth an actual order. I think. 25 would not be un, uh, unreasonable with how many hands came up just in this room, maybe to begin with, and then we could add to that. What do you think? Okay, so here, here are the things to pass around. That's that same picture. There's a hat with the actual, this insignia put on, put on it that I told you about and it can be any size that you, that you want to. And at least for sure, if you did the leatherette thing, it's cheaper than embroidery and more. And if, since they do it in-house, you could get, a, get them quicker. Um, and the, if you did a hat and an apron, they would be identical in that patch except for the size of it and so on. Any questions about this potential purchase to have them in place? So, all right, next. Vicki, so by our bylaws, uh, we have an election every year, and the election is always in April, and it substitutes for an actual presentation. So next, next month, there will not be a presentation. There will be this election of officers and so on. And bylaws require us to present to you the slate of officers that you're going to be uh, voting on. Um, and we need to present them to you both in the March and the April meeting. So this is the March meeting, and that's why she's doing it now. So, I, Vicki, I think you ought to, we ought to say that all eight are really going to be voted on, right? Not well, well, except five, director. Five are voted on. Well. The other three are serving multi-year terms. Yes. In other words, we have incumbents who, but still, I think they get Right, Th approved, these incumbents so. get okay. voted on. They're because so. they're one-year terms. Yes. And the director is a four-year term, and this is the one that's due this year. Yes. Okay, go, go ahead. Give okay. us your play. Be before I give the official slate, I just wanted to comment to particularly the new members and visitors that we have here today. I hope you saw that we have a huge outreach and community component to this guild from the toy program to the table program to working with the schools there are lots of opportunities to get involved and give back to our community okay stop that so on behalf of the nominating committee which consisted of uh, Wayne Humphrey and Tom <laughs> uh, uh, Tom Tierney um, you know what's his name I just wanted to say these are the candidates that we have vetted and that we are offering to you as our slate to vote on next month. You can see that Brian Ellison, right here to my left, 
is a past president. And to my other left is Corey Donner. Your other left. <laughs> my left left. And then Adam Connors is our incumbent secretary. Joe Turner to my right is our incumbent treasurer. And Bob Castiger, who is completing the cycle of director that filled Jay's spot when Jay elevated to president. So that is the open director position. And as I said, directors serve four years. And every year we have one more that turns over. So nominations are still available from the floor this month and next month. Yes. So, Brian, do you want to say two words, three words, no more than five? <laughs> <laughs> no more than five. Okay, I'll be real quick. Um, for everybody who's new, um, I was president right before Jay. I brought Jay in. Uh, and I like to have fun no matter what I do, so I hope um, I can get back to, uh, uh, you know, cracking jokes and making fun of, uh, of a meeting. Okay. okay, thank you. <laughs> and then Corey Donner has agreed to run as vice president. Greetings. Um, as she said, I'm Corey Donner. Uh, I've been doing woodworking, like I've said, a long time ago, roughly 38 years uh, I'm 48, so I started out at like 10. Uh, mind to tell you though, I am actually eager to learn everybody that is here and uh, hopefully bring our guild forward, uh, young and old both. And um, that's about it, you know, I step forward with it and it. take a mess. All right. <laughs> All right, Jay, that is our official slate of candidates that, I, that, the, te that the committee offers up to, Thank to the you, guild. Thank you, Vicki. And the good, good thing about Brian coming back is I don't have to be a mentor to him. He's, he's already been the president before. Uh, no, so we, like Vic, Vicki said, the floor is open to nom nominations from people from the floor. So if any of you have any other names that you would like to bring up and put forward, you can do so today or before the election next month. Are there any of those in the room right now? If not, we will bring them back up at, at the election itself uh, next week. So thank you very much. Um, so now, the show and tell people, if you haven't already, kind of move up towards the front here. And I don't have my list now, so please introduce yourself one at a time as you are talking about whatever you're talking about. A lot of people haven't seen me around for a while. I got sick right after uh, um, Jay took over. Uh, so I had three operations in a period of six months. So in between each one of the operations, I could only do very little woodworking. So uh, this is my six month uh, trial for intarsia for scrail saw. Uh, had to have you know, something to do between them. But while I was recuperating, I spent more time on my 3D printer because uh, <laughs> I had to do something and learn something. So I made inserts for my uh, bandsaw table because uh, I uh, use a, a big vacuum system. And the back, the, the back plate just doesn't suck enough. So I made all kinds of different uh, stuff to where as I'm drilling holes, all that stuff sucks down into the bottom. So. But I had to learn something. So. I ran out of yellow, so I went to red, and <laughs> you can buy those inserts for a whole lot more money if you want to spend a whole lot more money. Oh, I'm sorry, Rich, Rich, Rich Sanders. This this is pretty simple. I just thought with the time of year that's coming up, for any of that are a little bit bored on something to do that'll this turns out to be a pretty good and a little project for hanging outside and I do have in the bag here I've got everything except the wood and the one pin on top here but uh, the cable and The threaded rod that goes in between here, bolts, nuts, washers, all that I've got. There's enough here for three people if you're interested. But that, 
makes a nice smooth. I mean, even the I've included the. I had a couple extra of the yeah. hooks here. So if anybody's interested, why give me a holler here. Thank you. Thank you, Rich. Okay, I'm Keith Lassant. I work out at the, the park, and we've been doing a lot of the whimsical garden uh, things. And so, uh, one of the, some of the things I've been working on, I've got here, are uh, inhabitants of the garden. We've got a, a couple of, of little gnomes. Uh, there will be a, a bridge or two there. So we had to have a troll to go under the bridge and some fairies. Great. And Bill, Shukat. For the whimsical woods, uh, I found a picture on Etsy of this um, triple birdhouse. Um, it's about three feet tall, and I talked to Gronfeld, and he said, this will work fine. So it, it's all painted. Um, actually, I've painted it some more since then, filled in the missing spots, and that's ready to go over there. And he said that somebody else was interested, apparently, in buying one. And I've made a second one for my wife. I may sell that out from under her. <laughs> uh, You'll have to replace it. <laughs> yeah, of course I'll have to replace it. So <laughs> it's, it's been a simple project, just made out of uh, one by sixes and cut up, and um, but it's been fun. So give it a try. They would appreciate more things like this. Absolutely. Lee Wendell, did I say it right? You did. Thank you. Yeah. Built a monitor, can you hear me okay? Yeah. Built a monitor stand for my wife's computer, but she always wanted me to do something more, so I had to do a little inlaying in the drawers. Of course. And it's made out of cherry and um, polyurethane finish. So, any questions that anybody has, I forgot to ask uh, during the presentations, but for sure, but get your microphone. How, can I ask how it's finished? It's finished with uh, 15 coats of polyurethane, but it was thinned with um, turpentine, so it kind of soaked in. I've never really done a wipe on finish. I've always done sprays. Uh -huh. So this was the first time I've done it, and it turned out okay. It's, but I, it was a very fun project. I enjoyed it. Lee, where did you get the design? Wood Magazine. Okay. Wood, not Wood Smith. Yeah. No, not Wood, wood Smith. This is wood. My wife always looks at my magazines. Oh, this is pretty, this is pretty. Of course. But she doesn't want me to build anything. This she did, so. You know what you made when you put extra turpentine in with the poly? A what wiping poly. It was just poly, thin down poly. Well, that's exactly what wiping poly is. So it's thin down poly. So. It makes it less likely to run and so on. You can actually use a, a, a yeah, I found that out something to, th very to smooth, smooth it out. It didn't glob. It was, right. very, it was a good project to work on. But you doing it yourself was a lot less expensive than buying wiping poly. But <laughs> Thank you. Question. Um, the front, uh, is that an inlay? Yes. Uh, and this was uh, done on a router. And then I took and carved out the corners and then inlaid. So Are those individual pieces or is that a long strip? Yeah, that's one of those long strips. Okay, okay, thanks. So, yes. It's beautiful. Yes. How many times did you sand between coats? Um, I didn't sand. I used steel wool, so I guess it is sanding. That's the sir, put an abrasive on yeah, it. Yeah, it's done as abrasive. Um, but I did every time too. Every time. Very okay. lightly though. That's probably why I did 15 coats instead of two. Uh -huh. <laughs> okay. One problem of poly is it's slow drying, and so you really can't put layer after layer on the same day like you can with shellac or different things. That's true. 
um, and that's, that allows it to be a magnet for a dust and so on over the course of that 24 hours. Um, but anyway, that, it's beautiful. Thank you. But the, that form of inlay would be called banding, if I understand. I can't really see from here, but when you have a, a bigger band like that, it's still a form of inlay, but it's banding. That, banding? Yeah. I think banding is like three-quarter inch and you put it on the edge of plywood. Yeah. <laughs> but it's usually veneer that you make it look like it was three-quarter inch wood or whatever. Yeah, but true. <laughs> okay. Thank you very much. My Nate. pleasure. Thank you. Anyway, so I'd like to introduce to you Brad Bernhardt. He's a good friend of mine um, and a one heck of a woodworker in all shapes um, and sizes. He's been a very frequent com uh, contributor to Show and Tell, and you've all had a chance to look at his amazing work. I had to make this slide my PowerPoint before the official wording of uh, his presentation came in, out in the, the newsletter, I believe. So it is, all I said was the use of marquetry in woodworking but it's a little bit different than that. But you can look, he, or he can, he can say it again. <laughs> uh, uh, marquetry in general is using a veneer inlay to make a picture. So here are a couple examples in front of you, and those are uh, marquetry, flat marquetry, that was, were done by Mark Adams at Mark Adams School of Woodworking, uh, specifically. Uh, so he, when he did them to begin with, I'm, I know, I absolutely know that he did them one by one by hand. He did all his dyeing. So everything you see there is wood, and it isn't painted, it's dyed. The wood, pieces of wood are dyed to begin with. Um, so if that's just a, another yeah. kind of example of, of marketry here. Yeah, so um, Brad has a lot more samples here. Yeah, and I he's, a, and like I said, better. he's an outstanding wor wood worker in all forms. Uh, and we're so happy that he was able to come tonight and give you uh, his uh, presentation on exact, the raised ra woodworking that he makes his own too. So. Thank you, Brad. Thanks, Jay. Well, good evening. It looks like we've got a good group here tonight. I see a variety of ages as well. I see some young people over there and uh, some of us that are gradually getting older. And uh, I want to start real quick with uh, giving a thanks to Dan Linder. As of a week ago, Dan was scheduled to be the presenter tonight and I was going to talk on, I think, a mission-style bed build. And uh, I was due to talk in May, and being the knucklehead that I am, I, uh, we are due to have our first grandchild up in Chicago the third or fourth week of May. And I have for months been watching my wife sew blankets and clothes, and she's filled up a bedroom with stuff. And it took me till a week ago for the light bulb to go off and uh, to realize that it might be a problem if I was planning to be in Chicago, and I was scheduled to do this talk in May. So I thank Bob and Dan for working on and making that change. Um, I'm going to back up one slide, I believe. Let, let me look at the, you know what, I, in my uh, slides at home, I had that before the uh, marketry picture. So what I'd like to start with is an outline of where I would like for us to go tonight. And I would like to start by talking about what marketry is. Jay kind of gave an explanation, and I'm going to expand a little bit on that. We're going to talk about the tools and techniques that you use uh, to, thank you, to do a, a marketry build. Um, I am going to talk about my direction in the past year and a half that I've kind of wandered to the point of where I am now. And the place I am now with doing marquetry is I have uh, been doing my own shop saw and veneers, which I've found much um, better for the technique that I'm using and I've been more pleased with the results. So I'm going to describe for you how you tune a bandsaw up um, I'm going to uh, talk about the other tools, a joiner planer. I've got a unique combination machine uh, in my shop at home. 
and I'm going to talk a little bit about how to get a drum sander to uh, work well. And then I'm going to talk um, about uh, a card scraper at some point in the talk uh, regarding how to level your work when you're using veneer that's uh, a, a sixteenth of an inch thick as my shop saw veneer is. Uh, I brought my vacuum bag in here um, and I'm going to talk a bit about vacuum uh, pressing. I'm going to uh, end up with uh, a finish talking about uh, shellac, which I presented a talk about uh, maybe a year and a half ago uh, just on shellac as a finish itself. So I'm going to give some overview of that and why I think that's perfect finish to put on these pieces. And then we're going to, along the way, talk about some supplies and I'm going to give some references to books uh, specifically regarding uh, the technique that I'm going to spend most of the time on tonight, and that's the double bevel technique that's used in marquetry uh, production or the type that I am uh, working with. So the first thing I would like to do, as I said, Jay had talked about um, a little bit of a definition, and marquetry is the craft and art of cutting wood veneers into shapes. These shapes get glued together and they build a picture which then you apply to a surface. And the surface that we're usually using to apply them to is a stable surface that doesn't move with humidity um, like solid wood does. So these are being applied to uh, Baltic birch plywood is specifically what I use. Some people use MDF. Um, and the gluing process with them varies depending on the thickness of the veneer that you use. Um, I get people ask me questions when they look at pieces, whether the pieces were inlaid or not. And I wanted to give just a quick uh, definition on inlay work. Inlay work is the craft of excavating a recess in solid wood and then you insert a decorative element like the gentleman here at the end that uh, had done the banding around the drawers. Other examples of inlay work would be stringing. Um, these techniques were used most commonly during the federal furniture period uh, years back, but they're still carried forward in, in the uh, ornamentation of a lot of the furniture that gets built. Some other elements that were inlaid uh, commonly would include shaded fans, compass designs. Um, there is a marquetry pattern that embellishes legs called patere that uh, was used as well. Um, so that is kind of a distinguishing point between marquetry, which again sits on the surface of a piece of wood, and inlay that gets recessed into wood. So I want to talk for a bit about what, how I started with this process. I had thought about doing uh, marquetry work for a number of years. I had been busy building furniture, chairs, uh, boxes, doing bowl turning, doing a variety of styles of woodworking. And one of the members happened to be selling off um, some of his, or quite a bit of his um, woodworking tools and had for sale a veneer press. And so about two and a half years ago, I bought that and it sat in my shop and collected dust for about a year until I pulled out some of the books that I had bought that were on veneering. I had a couple of videos, uh, DVDs that were made by Paul Schurch. If I'm pronouncing it, Mike has taken a class with him. He uh, teaches uh, marquetry over at Mark Adams. And um, I pulled those out and I uh, started messing around with decorative veneer pieces. I ended up uh, buying a bundle of veneers uh, just to have a lot of different uh, choices in uh, woods and uh, grain patterns from veneer supplies. And the first piece that I ended up uh, doing was something that my sister had asked me about after our father had died, was to make a memorial box uh, for my dad 
uh, for some of my dad's um, patches and pins and stuff he had from the eight years that he was in the Navy. And so I started researching some of my books and, uh, and watching the uh, video from Paul Church on uh, marquetry. And he specifically talked about a technique called the knifing technique using a, a window method. And so the first piece that I did uh, was using some of this veneer that I had collected. Uh, the person I got the bag from as well had given me a few pieces of veneer. And I had to find a composition to do. And I decided the supplies needed to do this were an 11 blade exacto knife. And uh, I thought it would be a reasonably easy thing to uh, teach myself how to do. Um, the other way that, um, that uh, veneer is manipulated in marquetry is through sawing. And so your basic two ways that you're going to end up cutting and building these pieces together is either by knife cutting or Paul Schertz uses a uh, highly sharpened chisel that he holds and uh, navigates to cut uh, a lot of the pieces in the fantastic work that he does. Um, the other technique is to use a saw. And the saw really can do thinner veneer, and the saw can be a handheld fret saw um, where you're using often very small scroll saw blades, or it can uh, be to actually use a scroll saw. And those techniques that are commonly used are either making a packet of multiple veneers where you have a diagram on the top that you're cutting out parts that are all layered and positioned together to build your picture. That's called stack and packet or packet cutting. Or this technique that I'm going to show you in more detail tonight, which is double bevel uh, technique. And so the veneer thickness really dictates somewhat what you do, you would not be able to knife cut with the thicker veneer, the shop saw veneer that I've been recently um, using for all of my work. Um, so the thin stuff that's commercially made is really suited to do that type of marquetry work. And the stuff that's currently being made with some of the new modern tools is getting thinner and thinner. And it's gone from around 1 32nd to sometimes up around 1 50th or 1 60th of an inch. And so the first piece, as I said, that I tackled was with this random match of veneers that I had that were thin. And I really didn't put a caliper on them before I started putting this piece together. It's very important when you build a piece that you try to keep all of the marquetry um, veneers very similar in thickness, or it creates a lot of difficulty in how the piece gets built. And so when I went to, to build this piece again, my um, education of myself at that point had led me to go ahead and try this window process. And that's what's illustrated here from a book um, that I was using as a reference. And you can see the background veneer is what's under the fingers of the person that's holding the knife. He's holding a pointed knife uh, that's got an 11 uh, exacto style blade on it. And he's cutting out the uh, piece from the diagram that he has drawn, his marquetry uh, uh, cartoon picture is what some people call this, um, that's applied to the background veneer. He's cutting out the first piece. Um, and what you would do is you would cut that out with the um, scalpel blade and that would open up a window that you could see through, and then you would position the insert piece of veneer under that, and you would be able to tell from the color and the grain pattern if that was going to achieve the artistic effect that you were interested in. So when I got busy to do this first piece, my picture that I'd selected is in the right upper corner there. This was a cartoonish picture that I found online. My father was an electrician, and even though he wasn't a lineman, he had worked for a power plant for his whole career. And I thought, wow, that kind of represents the winding road of, of a 
power man. And so not really fully knowing exactly how I was going to get all these pieces cut, I took on arranging the veneer and starting to cut with the knife each of these different colored pieces and shaped pieces you see one at a time, including the power poles. I had to adjust the picture as you often do somewhat. I had created that, what I'm calling a, a marquetry cartoon in the lower right corner, which is quite busy. And in the end, because of the difference in the thickness of all the veneers, this took several days of work, a ton of taping, difficulty gluing and getting this all to stick together, and really coming to a, a dead end, I thought, about how to put the uh, power lines in. And so what I ended up doing was mounting it without the power lines, and I went to a technique called pa pattern inlay. I made some of the uh, curves that are involved in the way the power lines swing, and I used a very small uh, Dremel-sized tool in a router base and freehand with my pattern routed those in and then I did string inlay to put those uh, lines in. So that was a combination of both of the techniques that I had already defined for you. That took a ton of time as I said and I really felt unsatisfied with the process although I wasn't discouraged from continuing to pursue marquetry so that's the box, and the end result was great. I've done quite a few different boxes. The uh, walls on it were veneered wood as well. Let's go on to the next. So what I really want to spend most of the talk about, and what I'm showing over on the tables here, all these pieces, with the exception of one piece, was done with a hand fret saw uh, at my bench. Uh, in a technique called double, double bevel marquetry. So I'm going to show you a picture of what double bevel marquetry is. And I made a um, sample board where I've got a maple background and a pecan heart that I uh, made. And I want to send this around. And this really is going to be a easy representation of what this slide is trying to show. So basically the top piece would be the the top of this is a show face um, and that is the background veneer where all of these pieces if you're building a picture would be inserted um, and that piece is being cut on a uh, uh, on a marquetry donkey or at a scroll saw where there is a tilt to the table. And that tilt is for thicker veneer about eight degrees and thicker veneer would be the shop sawn veneer which is generally made, I make it to 5 64th which is just a hair over a 16th of an inch which after it's leveled is going to be the final thickness. Um, but the tilt on that is going to be at uh, 8 degrees for thicker veneer. If you go to commercial veneer, to get a bevel that's going to make these pieces go together, you're going to have to tilt that table around 16 to 20 degrees. And so my first attempt at a piece was to use a scroll saw with the table tilted at 18 degrees with some of those thin veneer pieces. That is not easy, and that also became very frustrating for me, much like the window technique. And so immediately I realized that I needed to go to making my own veneer. And there's a number of reasons why that was advantageous. And um, since then, I've kind of grown with the technique and found that to be a very desirable way to make marquetry. And I'm going to really kind of go into the process in quite a bit more detail. This slide, just to finish out, and it's going to be shown here in this piece that I'm sending around for you guys to hold. The, you, you put this in one piece at a time. You typically, in a real picture, are never going to cut from the edge. You want to leave your background veneer border intact for the stability of the piece 
and all of my marquetry cartoon is drawn inside that. So whatever picture I'm doing is going to be inside that, and I'm going to be making a place for my scroll saw or my fret saw blade to go through with a small drill, and it's going to be a very small hole that will allow me to feed a blade up through it and cut. But for this illustration, just to show how these go together, the background veneer is as shown on the top. That's the show face. The bottom is the insert piece of veneer. And so you're cutting through two pieces of veneer that with shop saw veneer are going to together equal about an eighth of an inch. And so the waste piece in the background, if you'll switch to the next slide, gets discarded. And I do have the waste piece for the piece that I cut that I'm sending around in my hand here. Um, the the um, waste piece gets discarded, and because of the beveling, the bottom piece pops up into where that piece was discarded and gives a near gap-free fit if it's done right. And the technique for doing this is to, when you're sawing, really try to keep the saw completely vertical in line with your body as you're sawing. And then the table tilt that you've set up will give you that perfect bevel. And it doesn't have to be absolutely exact to get a nice fit, but it needs to be pretty close. And the closer you can be in that comes into some of the learning curve and the repetition you get with sawing hundreds of pieces out. Next slide. So why use this double? Why go to all the, the uh, hassle of doing this? I've already mentioned the gap benefit. The other thing is, as you cut these pieces, you can individually orient each piece by picking a color that really gives you the picture, the artistry to the picture that you're trying to create. Um, you orient the grain um, to give a different perspective in the picture, and you can do what's called sh sand shading, which I'm going to explain more detail as we go along. But sand shading involves burning an edge of the insert piece so that it adds a dimensionality and it takes you out of a sometimes the two-dimensional plane that you're in into a third dimension with adding depth to the picture, adding a perspective like pieces are laying on top of each other. Same thing you get with inlay when you sand shade pieces and you take like a fan and it looks like it's popping out at you. The other thing, and I've got a baggie over here of some of these shop saw veneers, when you do this technique you're able to position the insert piece below in a way that you can conserve a lot of your veneer material. So I may take a small piece about the size of an index card and use that for three, five, six individual pieces because I can position it exactly where I need it as I cut these pieces one at a time. Less waste. And th there was one last point. If, um, and the last point about this technique is it's repairable, and when I say repairable, what I mean is, and I've got slides as we go along uh, showing pictures of this, you can actually put a piece in and not be satisfied with the appearance, it not create the effect. Either you overshaded a piece, you undershaded it, you positioned the grain awkwardly. When you see the composition evolve in more detail, um, it doesn't give you the look that you're after. And so you have a lot of options with this technique that make it desirable. Next slide. So as far as wood selection for these veneers, I spent a couple of weeks going around and collecting wood and thinking about the tools that I needed to add to tools that I already owned. Um, we've got quite a few domestic woods that are good choices, but it really helps if you can put your hands on a number of different exotic woods to give your color palette to build these pictures a lot more variety. And I brought in, I don't know how many, probably it looks like maybe three dozen different pieces of veneer and probably two thirds of them are from exotic woods. I've labeled them if you're interested at the end of the talk to take a look at. 
You particularly want to get a variety of grain patterns and a lot of different species of wood, as you know, um, have different grain patterns to them. Um, certain things that you would do with wood, you want monotony and you want similar, but for doing marquetry work, variety is really what you're after. Um, cost is an issue. Some of these woods are quite expensive and you end up buying small pieces. A small piece of uh, ebony. I don't know how many people have bought ebony that are in here. I mean, you can spend $50 on a one by one by 18 inch piece. Um, and the other issue that comes more with some of the exotic woods that would make it difficult even if they were thinner is the hardness of the wood and the fibrousness of the wood and some of the things that allow the wood to exist in a more hostile environment with more bugs and germs and things attacking it. Um, some of these exotic woods have Jenka scores that are triple what some of our common woods like cherry and maple. So a lot of our domestic woods are in the 700 rating, maybe up to 14. Um, walnut, I think, is about eight or 900. Hard maple is about 1,400. Mahogany is about 800. When you get into the exotic woods, ebony, I think, is like 3,600. Ipe is similar. Um, the ligum vitale, if I'm pronouncing that correct, I think is 4,500. So it would be impossible to cut through those with a knife, but with a fret saw, it is possible, although it makes it a little harder to make turns uh, when you're cutting tight acute angles, but it definitely is possible to do. Next slide. So this is something the, the marketarian really, and, and I think I've already talked about this in enough detail, but color and grain pattern really can limit a piece or it can inspire a piece that you're building. And so most of the time, you're having to make adjustments for what you're seeing visually and what you can do with your wood. And the broader your palette of colors and grain patterns, the better. Next slide. So I'm gonna just quickly show some pieces I've done. It's pretty obvious that I'm kind of a bird nut, and that's been the subject matter that I've chosen to do most of these pieces around. I've only been working and doing some of this detailed work for about a year now. Um, that is a wren, uh, that's a uh, goldfinch, that's a blue heron. Uh, next slide. Um, that is a piece, uh, a dogwood limb in flower in the spring with a bee. That is a bird in flight. I'm not sure exactly the species. That's a cedar waxwing. Um, next slide. And that is a female cardinal. Red is a particularly difficult color to come up with. Box Elder is one of the few species of wood um, that I found that I could duplicate some of the colors that were in a female cardinal. The male cardinal, cardinal would be probably impossible because it's almost an entirely red bird. Um, and I'll show more later about how the cartoon gets drawn and redrawn and redrawn in this one piece at a time build of your picture. Next slide. So I'm going to show just some pieces of wood. Um, some of these are a domestic wood paired with an exotic. On the left is an exotic yellow heart or yellow wood. I've got a variety of different colors with grays in them, different swirling grain patterns. The piece on the right is mulberry, and that has a fairly uniform, or at least the, the uh, board that I got, a fairly uniform. It almost looks like it's got a sycamore-ish look to the grain pattern, but it, it does give you another choice in yellow. Next slide. Um, that's the box elder with the stain. That's, a, I believe, a fungal stain that's carried by a beetle that infects. Next slide. Um, teak, I wasn't aware you had the varieties of color tones in teak. This one in particular had some blacks, some black browns, some grays, some orangey yellow tannish colors. 
Again, more variety, the better. Next slide. Um, this is Poplar. Poplar has the potential to have a lot of variety of colors. You're doing leaves and different landscape designs where green is an important color to come up with. Um, a couple other pieces that I've used that have a green hue to them, I'll describe as we go along. Next slide. Uh, this is ebony. If you're doing stringing and buying a piece of ebony, you're going to want it to be as dark as possible. They usually cover it with paraffin and you can't see completely what's inside that paraffin unless you scrape it off. For marquetry, variety again is what you're after. And so the different hues of gray and black give you a, a, a really a, a more natural look to your picture as you build it. Next slide. This is uh, Black Limba. Black Limba is another exotic wood. It's got quite a variety of grain pattern and a number of different colors. And surprisingly, the lighter color played off on the darker color in the middle uh, piece there makes a beautiful leaf. And the uh, zebra finch picture I'm going to show, a number of the leaves, and that's probably going to be the most complicated piece that I'm going to show tonight. Um, a lot of those leaves are made from black limba. Next slide. This is Ipe. A buddy of mine deconstructed a deck for an old neighbor of ours and said, hey, do you want some Ipe? And uh, I let him use my joiner. Ipe has got a lot of silica in it, and it is a Jenka hardness, about 3,500. And I've got a spiral head with carbide. Um, I put a mask on. Silica is not good for your lungs. Um, and my buddy uh, did not want to wear a mask, which I think was not a great choice, although I've got a pretty good vacuum system. But um, Ipe uh, makes uh, also the green tones uh, made for some nice leaves in some of the marquetry pictures that I did. Uh, next slide. Ponderosa pine, I hesitantly tell you where I picked this up uh, because I couldn't believe I found this at Home Depot. Um, they had some unbelievably cool spalted ponderosa pine, and I was with my wife looking at something else, and when I picked up two boards of that, she said, don't you have enough wood? Yeah. And which I, I have quite a bit of wood. I was not doing marquetry at the time, and I just said, I'm going to do something with that sometime. That became my blue heron, and that was one of the only sources I had for blue, blue-gray, um, and that as well, I think, is fungal beetle stain. Um, that's what's, I believe, killing a lot of our pine trees, uh, particularly out west. Next slide. Um, persimmon is a domestic wood. Um, surprisingly, it looks kind of mundane, dull, but um, the gray tones in uh, the zebra finch picture to me look spectacular, and I was very happy I had that. Uh, the black can play off of uh, some of the darker black with, uh, with um, ebony and a couple others, the black and the poplar. So again, back to the word variety. Next slide. Um, and this is holly. And again, with holly, like ebony, if you're buying it for stringing, you're going to want as wide as possible. But for marquetry, these, these streaks of gray, again, to me, make a picture look much more realistic. And over in the right corner, I'm going to show you later when I said that double bevel marquetry was repairable. I'm going to show you the zebra stripes that I ended up replacing because the look did not give me what I was after on the lower neck and the, the um, upper breast of the male zebra finch. And that is some of the cutout you can see where I used a small section of holly, which is not cheap, for a number of insert pieces. And again, double bevel gives you that option. Next slide. I want to talk just for a second about an L fence. Um, next slide. So this is the only slide I'm going to show on it, but this I saw in fine woodworking a couple years back. And what that does is it clamps to your fence the 
outside plane of your carbide on your uh, table saw blade is right in line with the outside edge of that fence. And you take a wanky board, and natural edge boards sometimes are sold much thicker, and if you like the pattern, you can get a number of pieces of shop saw and veneer out of a five quarter, six quarter piece of wood. And to make the veneer, you need at least one flat face and a completely square corner to ride on the, uh, on the table of your bandsaw. And so I double stick tape with carpet, a straight edge, on my piece that I'm gonna make shop saw and veneer on the left. That allows me to ride that fence against my L fence, which will cut right up to the edge of that fence if I position the blade correctly. The height of the blade is just above the piece of wood that I'm cutting to make veneer out of, and the offcut piece will fall under that fence. You can cut all different kinds of straight designs. You could cut an octagonal, a triangular piece by using this technique. Um, Double-sided carpet tape is super sticky. You can reuse it multiple times if you use a little care. It's so strong, you have to take a putty knife and pry that off. And so I used to put more on. Now I've gotten down where I'll put a couple little short segments of maybe four inches. I don't, how many of you guys have used double-sided carpet tape for, yeah, so I'm not saying anything new. Next slide. Um, I wanted just to show what I've used in my shop. I have a combo machine. Anybody else own a combo joiner planer? So I don't know why, but about four, 12 to 14 years ago when I was really getting involved in woodworking, I decided I like the extra width. You sacrifice the length of the in-feed and out-feed table. So if you're trying to level really long pieces, it's not ideal, but the 12 inches really allows you to prep a lot of rough sawn wood based on having a wider. So for this application, next slide, this machine looks like this, and it's in joiner mode now where I'm doing my first face, running it across. It's a spiral cut carbide head um, machine. When I originally bought this, it was about $3,200. Uh, a guy brought it in a 18-wheeler uh, down our street, which was restricted for 18-wheelers, and I had to give him a, a good-sized tip to get him to do it. The guy was an ex-football player for Missouri State, and he actually helped me take that 200 feet to the back of my property, to my shop, on a dolly. That thing weighs about 450 pounds, I believe, and the guy was a beast. <laughs> so, And I'm not a beast, obviously. Um, so that's the planing mode in the right upper corner. The dust hood flips up over and that goes into planer mode and you adjust that cast iron bed up and down. The lower one shows the uh, carbide inserts. And surprisingly for all the pieces of wood I've prepped on that, I am just getting ready after my buddy Silica Ipe, and I don't know how many board feet we did of his, but um, I'm just getting ready to switch to my fourth surface and, and then I'll have to replace them. So I, they really last a considerable amount of time if you don't nick them with nails. It helps to have a magnet wand to run over your wood. If you're buying rough sawn wood that somebody's sawn, it's not uncommon to find somebody drove a nail in it or a piece of barbed wire. Next slide. So bandsaw, I mentioned that I was gonna hopefully say something if you have zero interest in marquetry that you'll find useful. Um, so I wanna explain how I set up a bandsaw. So, to do these resawn veneers. And I'll go through some of these, these uh, bullets here, um, and then I've got pictures of them, and I'll explain them in more detail. So the blade, you've got to carry away a lot of sawdust. So a three tooth per inch, that's what TPI stands for, for the young guys over there, the one guy's yawning, sorry. Um, the uh, three TPI stands for the number of teeth per inch on the blade, and typically for a resaw blade, you're trying to use a wider blade, which is a little bit stiffer. I have a 14 inch 220 Laguna bandsaw um, that's got a two and a half horsepower. 
a 110 would be fine if your blade is sharp and it's tuned up well. Um, so I started using the Highland Wood Slicer, which is a good blade to use with shipping. They're about $50. But what is happening is I'm sawing through some of these high Janka exotic woods and I'm sawing through wider pieces of wood and I end up dulling the blade. The blade gets hot and it stretches and it stops tracking and you can't you can't readjust in a way that gets to track so you throw it away. I went through two of those blades and I finally wised up and I bought the Laguna and there's other companies that make a carbide blade. I bought the Resaw King and I went from three quarter or excuse me a half to a three quarter blade and the three quarter width blade is the max I believe that you can get on uh, certainly my 14 inch that completely fills up the tire. Um, blade tensioning, I'll say a little more about that when I do the picture. Um, and uh, well, actually I tell you what, so, so, so basically on the tensioning of these blades, um, you can see them flutter if they're under tensioned and you can tension them until the flutter completely disappears and they track. Or you can try and use a technique where you open the upper wheel, you go to the nine o'clock position on the wheel and you come down about six inches and with moderate pressure with your thumb, see how much the blade deflects. And it should deflect about max about a quarter of an inch. All of that's quite subjective, but that's typically how that I've been checking, and some of it is just from feel. You add a little bit to it if it feels like it's not tracking. Again, with these veneers that you're trying to saw, you're trying to have, some of them are quite wide. I'm able to do up to about a 13 inch veneer um, with my, with my uh, saw, a 13 inch wide veneer. And so to have the same distance or thickness at the top and the bottom really requires a, a bandsaw setup that is, that is very well thought through. Guide placement is an issue. I'll sit, talk about that with the pictures. Blade drift, I use a new fence that really seems to uh, alleviate that problem. Um, the fence height and type I'm gonna talk about for a second, and then I'll show you how to use a uh, scrap piece of wood to do the fence to blade distance both at the bottom, maybe middle and upper part of your cut when you're doing some of this wider. Next slide. So the goal is to make veneer um, that's reproducible. I try to get it when it comes off the drum sander to be 564th. That gives me a 64th to play with when I'm leveling and I end up with a 16th of an inch. You'll have a backer veneer on your piece. I usually use 3 8 inch. Baltic birch plywood, I have not used MDF. It would be an option. Um, you can buy plywood at the big box stores, but the quality of it, the number of plies is gonna be inferior and you spend a lot of time making these pictures. So you wanna use pretty good products so they stay together. Next slide. So this shows me, typically I would actually make sure the blade was square to the to the table and because you can adjust um, a little bit more with your fence. You can shim the fence, you can use some tape as I'm gonna show you if the height varies more than you want from the bottom to the top. The fence that came with mine and a typical resaw commercial fence I think is in the five, maybe six inch range. The one I built is eight inches in height. Um, next slide. So this shows the fence I built. This was in shop notes. I don't know if anybody saw that in fine woodworking. A couple of, uh, uh, a, maybe it was a uh, magazine or two back. And I went ahead and built it. The support rail on the inside, I used quarter sawn wood so that it wouldn't move. That's what the T-bolts hold it to my cast iron. Uh, adjustable part of my bandsaw. The height again is eight inches and typically what this does for you, I extend it about an inch past the back of the blade and when you're sawing through these wider boards making your veneers, once you get inside the board, 
the moisture content, even if it's appropriately dried, is going to be such that the wood may move, it may spring open. When you're cutting these veneers, you typically want to cut a whole board in one setting. If I cut a couple slices off a white, off a thick board, and I leave it overnight and I go back out, it's likely it's going to cup or move. So this type of fence, when your off cut is moving, allows the board to move a little bit. And it really, in what I've noticed, diminishes any kind of drift that you're getting. Next slide. This shows how the back of the fence, uh, how I have a router bit that cuts the T-bolt after the vertical part is cut with a table saw blade. And I uh, am able to attach that to my cast iron. This top part separates from the bottom part and you're able to shim underneath this if needed with like a piece, of, piece or two of uh, uh, blue tape is what I usually use. Um, you can barely see it down in that right lower corner small picture, but I had a little bit of variance. If you put a caliper on one slice of uh, blue tape, it mine wouldn't even measure it. So it's over one one hundredth, but that actually transmitted all the way up that fence and gave me an equal gap between the fence and the blade at the bottom and the top, just that amount of shimming. And you can see there's some adjustments on the back. A lot of the bandsaw blades have adjustability for shimming that fence a little bit. Next slide. So the blades, I have ceramic guides. The inside blade, I would push all the way up to the blade, just lightly touch the blade. The outside guide, I would put a thin piece of paper, a dollar bill, something like that, and just have it off the blade a bit. You do get with the back support guide and those guides some sparking. It's not excessive. You want to be able to spin the blade freely with, uh, with the machine off and just running you know, the wheel manually with your finger. Um, next slide. Um, and this is what I use, a scrap piece of wood. I'll check my gap at the bottom. I'll check it again at the top. Next slide. This is the veneer that's coming off the board. That was that wide piece of maple. That's uh, close to 11 inches in width. Uh, again, on a 14, you can get about 13 inches of, uh, of supported uh, of cut. Um, I'm using push pads and a push stick there for safety. Next slide. If you've got it tuned up well, you can even get your last piece to cut away and get two usable pieces of veneer. Usually those come off maybe a, if it's really tuned up well, I'll go a little less than 3 30 seconds. And so I have just a smidge to take off to get down to my 5 64th and hopefully that's maybe two passes through my drum sander. Next slide. This is a drum sander I bought. I just wanted to mention speed. Um, if you run these things too fast and you try to take too deep of a cut, you're going to burn the wood and you're going to gum up your sandpaper with burned stuff that will not come off. So please, when we replace out at the shop in the drum sanders, the sanding, think about that when you do because that paper is modestly expensive and the result all of that stack that I've got over there on the um, right upper came from that paper, which is 80 grit down below, that I kept clean and I lowered the speed and I was able to cut successfully my uh, veneers to a point where I only needed a couple of passes. Now, how do I know all this? Because I've made every mistake you can make in doing this stuff, but that's, my um, spiel on, on how to get your bandsaw to perform. Next slide. And there's a caliper. I think all of us need one of those. Next slide. That's the, the uh, shelving system that holds these and some other uh, veneers. I think they look more impressive on the table there. You can see the variety of grain and uh, color. Next slide. So how do you choose a subject for your marquetry? Um, there's a number of places to look. I'll tell you what <clears throat> I use, but I've got a number of books now. Most of them have pro projects in them. 
The best book that I've found for the double bevel technique is Craig Vandal Stevens' book. Uh, we have one of his books that I had for a couple of months out of our library. I'll show a picture of it. Another one I bought online. You can buy these books on Amazon used for 10 or $15. Um, so I went through in practicing a number of sample things and projects to try and build up my skill. Um, you can look at other people's work online and trace some of it. You don't want to sell it. Most of that stuff is copyrighted. And the person that I really um, um, dissected his pieces and have copied three of them um, has a copyright I know on his stuff. Now, maybe I'm expanding the copyright law a little bit, but I, uh, I think that's a good resource. Um, photographs and paintings, uh, I use Pinterest a ton for the stuff that I've done. Most of the birds are photographs um, that are on Pinterest, and I've started to modify the photographs some with um, different techniques, coloring books, and then Mike and I, I know, belong to the American Marketarian Society. Um, anybody else get that publication? Nobody? It's pretty cheap. If this appeals to you at all, it's a great uh, resource. Um, and uh, I, anyhow, so next, next slide. So the guy that I told, that I mentioned that I have used and three of his pieces, when I say use them, I, you definitely, you know, change around the wood veneers because of your supply. Um, but, and you may modify the shapes of leaves a little bit or something with, but, but you can take a picture like that, hang tracing paper that I'm going to show you over your computer screen, trace this image, adjust the size of it before you do that, and then have it up on a computer and be looking at it when you're doing your picture, picking your veneers. Um, and so uh, this guy's name is Craig Altabello. He's out of New Hampshire. He has some fantastic stuff. Um, next slide. So some issues to consider, and I'll be real brief. We've already talked about color and grain. How close to the original piece do you need to be? You're never going to be exact. Um, this, this doesn't give you all the options you would have if you were a watercolor artist or, a, 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 or an oil painter. But it is super cool, in my opinion, to be able to take wood and make a picture and not even dye the wood. I know Mark's stuff down here that uh, Jay brought in is fantastic. You thought it might be CNC cut? Uh, or, or more recently. But yeah, I, I think to be able to cut something with hand tools old school and be able to use natural wood is, it, and also to do a project where your shop is relatively quiet and you can listen to the radio or podcast or whatever you want to do, it really is a cool thing and quite different than running your vacuum constantly and power tools. Um, so again, I'm expressing that for whatever reason this appeals to me. Um, does it matter if you modify it? And it really often doesn't. And, and it, do you have the necessary skill? I did not start at some of these more complicated pieces. And I put a lot of time into this in the last year. These pieces, one piece at a time, take sometimes, I, I, I don't even know the amount of hours. I would guess they, it would be five, eight hours of a day work to do like the most complicated pieces I've done if I work that long consistently. Um, and often you need to simplify. Next, next slide. So I mentioned I'm going to talk about how you uh, draw up your um, cartoon. Next slide. So I buy these things at Michael's or Hobby Lobby. That's tracing paper. I transfer the image to my background veneer by using graphite, the old carbon paper. The um, tracing paper, I'll hang over my computer. I'll adjust the image up or down based on the size of my background veneer. If I have a smaller piece, then, then I want to put an image on it, and I'm able to cut the pieces 
correctly, then I will reduce it. Um, next slide. So this shows the cartoon that's lifted up. I've got a couple reference circles. This is the zebra finch that I was mentioning, the carbon paper. So basically, as you cut each of these pieces, as you cut each of these pieces, this, by the way, is the persimmon, that's ebony, that's um, holly, that's been sand shaded, that's teak, that's pecan, this is ebony uh, and holly. Um, this is the uh, black limba that I mentioned. This is the very hard ipe, that's bacote. Um, so I will show a picture of what I'm trying to represent uh, on my computer here in a minute. Um, that is a dead pen that I like the shape of the tip that I use as a stylus. And I will put this, after you cut out a piece, you will, you will need to redraw some of the additional lines so you will be able to register with these circles. And you'll put the carbon paper in. You'll use this type of stylus um, to trace over the lines and redraw your cartoon. Next slide. Uh, this is my busy setup. I've got my marquetry donkey at an eight degree bevel because I'm using shop sawn, about 16th inch veneer. I've got a hot plate. I've already burned through one. I upgraded to a Cuisinart or something like that. It was a little more expensive. I'm hoping it'll last longer. I've got a cast iron skillet. I started putting a top on it because it holds the heat in better. I've got sand in there that I bought at Michael's. Um, it's like terrarium sand. You don't want to use beach sand. I've got the thing over. This is my cart. This is my picture off of Pinterest, and that's kind of an artist um, rendering of two zebra finches, a male with the zebra stripes and the female in a uh, flowery garden that that bird exists in uh, Australia, primarily a gorgeous finch bird. There's a number of really spectacular finches. Um, there's a European finch as well that is, is quite beautiful. Um, I've got my cartoon down here overlaying the piece that I've been working on for many hours building. Um, I'm drilling holes to put my saw blade through. The saw blade is a 2-0 blade. I use my fret saw and I'll show the positioning in just a second. That 2-0 blade is 1 128th in thickness. That's how thin it is. They break easily. Um, the tooth to the back of the blade is 2 128ths or a 64th. And my hole that I'm drilling with a number 71 drill bit in a handheld pin vise, these bits would not fit in any kind of standard chuck. That drill bit is um, three 128s. Now, I only know that because I put a caliper on all that today. I'm not really a number nut. But um, you're dealing with very small dimensions here with this. And that's how these holes get hidden if you actually have to drill into a piece and replace an entire piece that's bordered all the way around with a finished piece. Um, and then you tilt that blade at a little bit more of an angle uh, to allow that hole to disappear as it goes down through your background piece, which you've put a piece in you're not happy with, and your new insert piece below. Next slide. So the tools that you need, I use an ellipse uh, fret saw. It's got an 11-inch throat depth. Those are cheap. I bought it from Highland, 20 bucks. There's a uh, jeweler's supply out in California, Auto Frey. I buy, uh, buy a gross. A gross is a dozen dozen. It's about 20 bucks for the 2-0 blades. A pen vise off of Amazon's 10 bucks. You can chuck a number of tiny little blades in that. I've used a couple different uh, bits. Uh, I was breaking more of the gyro bits or gyro. However, I discovered that for my higher Jenka woods that I should back them out and get rid of the accumulating in the uh, threads 
the accumulating dust and doing that and being just slightly more patient with the drilling, the bits are lasting much longer. Um, I use the uh, book that I mentioned, the Craig Vandal Stevens book that we have in the library to build my marquetry donkey. I've got it sitting over there and I'll show pictures. I've already talked about Craig's books. Next slide. These are the two books. The one on the left has some great projects in it. I think that's a beautiful piece on the cover. I made a tracing of that and might do that at some point. The book I bought for about 10 bucks is on the right. If you're at all interested in double bevel marquetry, those are two fantastic books. Um, next slide. That's the donkey. He's got plans for how to build that. A fret saw in the back. Those are the pen vices down below. Uh, a couple little blades. Uh, I use my dog on my vise to hold one side of that and the dog on my bench the other side and I let it hang over and I am sitting at a stool and I've got my music off to the left playing KC usually. Next slide. So this is, um, oh and I, I want to back up not in the slides but I mentioned, yeah, I mentioned that I did, the first time I tried double beveling, I did it at my, um, at my scroll saw, and I know a lot of us know how to use the scroll saw. I find for thin veneer at the bevel angle to do double bevel between 16 and 20 degrees to get those pieces to fit. It is a nightmare to have your table at a degree like this and try to hold a moving blade. It also is a nightmare to feed those little blades up through the bottom holder into the top. Once you get used to this uh, fret saw, blade screws in with just a, just a quick thumb turn. I push it against the donkey and it compresses the tension on the top part of the saw. And I do the same thing with the upper part. And you kind of get an idea where to adjust so it reduces the breakage. Um, the blades are cheap. So this is me sawing out on the yellow finch a piece and I have started with this double bevel technique. You want to start and go around in a clockwise direction. So that's the hole I drilled with the pen vise. I started sawing here. This is going to get replaced and this line will be finalized when I do the next piece down. This upper line where it mates up to these other pieces of yellow wood that I've used my grain and color variation theme to adjust the look. This gives me my finished line up here. And so I am cutting clockwise around. I've come full circle and I'm that close to the piece being ready to drop out. I've put in this, the uh, branch. I started embellishing my branches with little knurls or knobby areas, making them look more realistic. That's kind of something that I've tried to add to different, different things with the artistry in these pictures. That's the upper adjusting knob on the fret saw, and I'm at my seat, and you can see I'm trying to hold this saw vertical to my body while the background and the insert piece that's under it is at an eight degree bevel. Next slide. I just wanted to mention this. We often think when we do stuff by hand that we're much better off as far as dust goes. This produces a super fine powdery dust. A lot of these um, exotic woods in particular are sensitizing. Uh, you can have skin reactions and respiratory reactions to them. Um, domestic and exotic wood is a carcinogen. Um, we all breathe it. We're constantly breathing it out at our shop that's quite dusty at Faust Park even though we try to do a good job but we've got so many people using it. But I keep a vacuum right next to me and I will quickly vacuum off after every couple pieces I put in, take the mask off when I go to seat the piece, glue it in and level it. Next slide. Um, sand shading, I'm not going to say a lot, I already mentioned that it adds depth um, to, a, to a piece. If you're really into marquetry, you can think about where your light is shining on your subject 
And if you understand shadowing, light and shadow, you can actually get very sophisticated in how you make a marquetry piece look. And some of the really spectacular pieces make some of the stuff I've got here look childish because of the depth of understanding and artistry that some people put into this. One issue with shop saw and veneer, because it's thick, to get it to shade, you have to hold it in the sand longer. A problem with that is the wood dehydrates when you keep it down, and some woods more than others will deform shape. And if you've sawn a fairly intricate picture, and I'll show you that next, with a lot of ups and downs, if those deform, getting that to fit nicely into your background piece, you're popping it in from below, can be a problem. And I've had to replace a couple. Holly in particular dehydrates quickly, and that can create a problem. So, and it's sometimes difficult to control how much burn you get on this thicker veneer, but that's not enough of a negative to outweigh the many other positives, in my opinion. Next slide. So I mentioned I buy that sand at Michael's. I don't want to use beach sand. Those are some long tongs that I bought from Paul Church. Do you have those, Mike? Um, he used to sell quite a few more supplies. He doesn't seem to do that now. Next slide. Um, this is the piece I was talking about that I was sand shading. This is a blue heron, the feathers. I've already positioned the grain on a lot of the piece, but I'm wanting to shade to give the appearance of getting beyond a two-dimensional effect. And so, fairly complicated. I had a very tight body part as I was cutting all that, um, but surprisingly didn't break those pieces. Next slide. Um, and this is what it looked like with the shading at the bottom. So shading, even when you're kind of a novice at the shading, I shaded along the beak. That's yellow wood. I, did, I often do a little bit of shading around the eye. I try to make the eyes irregular a little bit because I think it looks more realistic than trying to get a perfect circle. I shaded the top of the head to make it look like it kind of was in a different plane than some of the rest of this. The back of the neck shaded these feathers. Um, this was one of Craig's pieces that I copied and did some modifications. The other thing I did is sometimes I've been playing around, and this sounds super goofy, and I, it probably is, but I'll play around with the background veneer for an effect I'm after. These are fish hunting fish, so, or fish hunting birds. So I saw this fish face, and I thought this kind of looked like water. Um, I know that's goofy, it's not blue, but so, you know, I, I guess when you spend too much time in your shop and you do this, you're prone to going absurd. Next slide. So the insert process selection again, variety, color, grain, locating placement and picture to try to look realistic, and then you glue the, these in, which surprisingly is a very quick process, and then often have a little bit of leveling. Next slide. Um, so this is my golden finch. That's my picture. I'm burning up the battery on my computer. That's all of the different variations of colors that I've got, lots of variety in my yellow wood. Um, there's some interesting grain you can't see well here that I've used on the breast of birds. Some of this gray made perfect to reproduce the, divi the division between the head and the body. Um, next slide. So this is me uh, using the pen vise. So your cartoon is on your show face, which is the top piece that you're looking at when you're sawing. The back side of the show of the uh, background piece does not have a cartoon on it. And so you have to often align where that piece goes so you cannot use a huge piece of insert veneer to cut a small piece. So I will often in my discard part saw a hole on one end and on the other end. This part of the background gets thrown away when I put the insert in. I'll draw a line. I measure down to see how big the maximum distance is. I will draw that line on the back, measure that same line. I'll do the same on the top of the line, and then I know exactly where my 
piece needs to go. I'll extend a little bit back behind wherever the hole is. I know this sounds like it would take forever. It's not super quick, but when you do this over and over and over, it gets much faster. Next slide. So this is the piece. It's going to go in again. That to me looks overcut almost with all the scallops, but the final result, when you don't have a gap, you really see that change in color. And I think it, it generally produces a very desirable effect. This is a monojet syringe that I'm using to glue. I will put tape on the show face. It goes in from the back side. I'll do a little bit of glue all around that, wipe it in with the tip of that. That takes just a few seconds to do. And then I'll push the piece down. That sets up, since it's a really tight joint, super quick. I've got a bunch of these that I've cut out. And I've even cut right up next to where the piece was put next to another. And they don't separate. So really, this technique gives you a very tight uh, end result. Next slide. I'm getting closer to being done, by the way. I'm we are a five till nine. Um, so uh, anyhow, kind of showing the same thing. Um, that's me using a little sanding block to level it. Next slide. And this is the end result. So my original picture here, you can see what that darker variety in yellow wood did. And you can see what grain direction did. And you can see the fact that I had some little spots in some of the wood that to me gave it more depth. I've got this back piece going in a slightly different direction where it feeds into the wings. I've got some variety in the color of my ebony. Uh, likewise with my teak, I sometimes will sand shade the division and the bill. Um, that's a fairly simple head for some of the ones I've done, but I was happy with the result on that next slide. Um, so what if you change your mind? So right here is the zebra finch bill. This is the most complicated piece that I've done. And on the male, and most males are a little more ornate than the um, female because they're competing for breeding um, and doing their, their color displays and their action displays. So I made these look kind of like, I thought this was probably the best I could do when I first did it. This is Holly against Ebony. And I made these kind of fairly uniformish um, uh, stripes across. And in the end, I wasn't real happy with that. Next slide. So the original zebra finch looks like this. Couldn't get the beak exactly the color. The cheek patch is not the color. Overall, the theme is pretty close, though. I wasn't happy with the fact that really that didn't look realistic. And so next slide. So what I ended up doing was cutting in. I put a piece of, ho of holly across the back of this. I marked where it went and I started cutting these and I would cut like three at a time because these ebony residual pieces were would be prone to breaking and I would glue them in and then I would do the next three, glue them in, do the next three and glue them in. And so you would only do this if you had the time and you were interested in the artistry of this, but I'm explaining this just to show how repairable and what levels you can start to take an art like marquetry um, to. The other thing I wasn't crazy about was this pattern that I put on the bottom. So I changed around the leaf a little bit. I put a new leaf on once on this bottom side. Maybe I replaced both. And I changed this around. So the final look, next slide, was this. Um, you could say that that was subtle, but to me, that was worth the time. The other piece that I changed around was I had burned the bottom of the wing and the grain direction I didn't care for as much as I l liked. And I'd spent quite a bit of time, obviously, doing this one piece at a time. And so this, when it was shellacked, I like this pattern, which was, again, variety in my wood. And I shaded lightly so that it would still, when it was shellac, stand out against this brown. Uh, next slide. And so the final steps are uh, card scraping, mounting. I'll just say a couple quick things on glue, pressing, 
and finishing. And I'll try to get that done in the next 10 minutes if you guys can be patient. Um, so next slide. So card scraping, um, we did a class on card scraping with nine or 10 people. I hope everybody, I think when they left, were able to get an adequate burr. This is what you're after, these type of shavings. Um, when you've got thicker veneer, you would never be able to do this to thin veneer, but this thicker veneer is very easy to uh, level. You've got quite a bit of wood. Next slide. So to get your card scraper to work correctly, you have to level the top with a file. And I use these polishing tools on the bottom. Um, this is a 45 micron and a 25 micron. I will polish the face right where it meets with the edge. And then I will use this burnishing rod to turn the hook. Next slide. So basically you're flattening and polishing so you get perfectly square. You're pushing a burr up and then you're turning it over. Next slide. So this is me leveling a piece of spalted maple. Next slide. Um, this is me scraping the paraffin where you can't see what you've got in your expensive piece of ebony. I forget whether that was red, wood, red heart. I, I'm not sure what that is. Next slide. Um, this is me leveling the dogwood piece with a B. Next slide. Um, so, a veneer bag you don't have to have. I got mine quite cheaply, um, and uh, I am really happy with using it. You can put calls on the top uh, as well. Um, I have found with a melamine bottom piece and me having a uh, mesh that allows the pull of air to go across my veneer, um, and I typically don't over glue these pieces where I get a lot of squeeze out. I'll get a little on the edges, but basically um, I found that to work well and give me a backed on both sides uh, piece that uh, basically when I'm gluing this up, I brought the roller. I bought the uh, roller from uh, Veneer Supplies when I first started using thin veneer. I will on my Baltic birch draw, draw a line, swiggly line. I will put some glue on that, roll it out to where I can still see the line, and then I will adhere the uh, piece of veneer. And I do not put any veneer, any uh, glue on the back side of the veneer. It only goes on, this, on the uh, substrate piece on the back. With the thicker veneer, I have been happy with Type Bond 3 or, or Type Bond Extend. Um, you get, you get uh, 10, 12, 14 minutes open time. I usually don't need that much with these small pieces. Um, when I was using the thin veneer, you tend to get more bleed through. And burl veneer, you get a lot of bleed through. The better bond veneer, um, cold press type glue works quite well. Veneer Supply sells it and they tent it. Um, it does expire in a year. Most of these PVA products last for longer than a year, um, sometimes multiple years. And so that is the process I use. Um, you are exerting with a vacuum bag. We're at, at sea level, it's about 15 pounds per square inch. When that's one atmosphere, when you go down to zero atmospheres inside a bag or close to it, you're exerting 15 pounds per square inch on that piece of veneer, pushing it down or sandwiching it uh, around your substrate. If you've got a 10 by 10 board, that's like putting 1,500 pounds of weight on top of that. That's how much pressure you're exerting. You can do this adequately with calls and a lot of clamps, um, but I, I, I find a, a, a veneer bag to be very desirable if you're doing much of this uh, work. My bag is about two feet by four feet in size, and I've got it up here with the pump if anybody's interested. Next slide. Uh, Baltic birch, plywood, not cheap. Um, and so that's a two and a half by four foot piece, 54 bucks for three eighths inch. Um, 
If I'm using thin veneer, I use a half inch. That way I can build a box, I can put my mortises for my uh, hinges, have some material to screw into, uh, do some other things with it, with putting splines, and next slide. So, just about done. Uh, exotic woods have an oily residue, especially ebony. Um, acetone will take that residue off. If I've got much, like this yellow finch has quite a bit of ebony, I will clean the surface with acetone before I glue it up. The other thing I found is brushing shellac um, ends up taking the oil out of a dark colored wood like ebony and putting it on a light colored wood like maple or holly. Has anybody else had that experience? Nobody's worked with these. So if that is ever something that you happen upon, if you will take spray can shellac and you will float it above your picture and let it settle down, you don't get any of that running that you get with brushing. When I do my brushing, I'm using a one pound cut. So I've got 50% more uh, denatured alcohol than what is in the two pound cut in a shellac sealer. So I will do about three coats with that, and then I may go ahead and brush it on. Until I discovered doing that, I was getting bleeding. That first marquetry piece I did for my dad's memorial, Leo. Is it spray uh, this stuff, D-Wax? It is D-Wax, that's the sealer. It yeah, it says, it says sealer on it. So you have to buy the sealer is two pound, the regular wax stuff would be three uh, pound. And you, as I talked about uh, 18 months ago or something, the diluting, but I find a one pound cut dries super quickly as well. I'll put a coat of this on and five or 10 minutes later, I'll put another. I usually put three coats. I'll let it set for a few hours. Sometimes I'll let it set overnight, put three more coats on. I really like the way that it pulls the color out at you. Um, and I'm just going to end by showing some pictures of that. Next slide. So that's self-explanatory. Next slide. So these are some of those pictures I showed in the beginning. So you can play around, as I said, with lots of nonsense with this. I tried to use a background spalted maple veneer that looked like air currents for a flying bird. That was my contribution to the artistry. This was something I saw online. Uh, Craig Vandal has a different postured bird as a project in one of those books I mentioned. Next slide. Uh, we've already talked about that one. Again, I like the ribboning effect of the, uh, of the background. So really spend some time, if you do this, picking the right background piece against your, uh, your composition. Next slide. Um, that one I've shown. Next slide. Um, this one I particularly played around with the walnut. This was crotch walnut that had a lot of different colors to it. I've got a piece of air dried walnut, not, um, not uh, kiln drying. Over here in this bundle, the vibrance of the colors is, if that's a word, I believe it is, is uh, so much better. Um, this was a picture uh, that was uh, on Pinterest as a photograph. I modified it, I put this limb in, I created some of these stems, I went outside and looked at some of our trees, these little nubby connections. Um, this is okay on the leaves, this is black limba again. Next slide. Um, a partner of mine, a medical partner, had asked me what I was doing since I uh, snuck away and retired early and I showed her pictures and she told me she loves birds in particular yellow warblers. This is the female yellow warbler. It's got kind of muddy appearance to the coloration. That's the natural color. The male is much more vibrant, competing to mate with the female. So I'm gonna do a male and female and give to her. I've got this setting over here and I kind of, this was a picture as well. Sometimes I'll look through a couple dozen pictures before I find something that I think I can do because of the veneer, my skill level, whatever. This was a sawn line that I didn't fill in, and then the glue plus me shading it a little darker by mixing sawdust gave this separation of the toes. Each of these nails were cut first, separate after I had built the log. That was the first part. I did the nails, I did the feet, I built up to here, I did the belly, 
I did all of this uh, intricate wing work and I ended up actually not liking, because of the coloration, my show face and I flipped it over and actually this is what was my backside that I ended up using as a finished piece. That's another option you get with double bevel. Next slide. And that's the final piece that I brought. This is, I would say, the most complicated piece. Somebody asked me earlier how much time, and I really um, don't, don't know uh, quite a bit. But it, it actually was interesting. And there are things I would do differently. Uh, this piece, as I said, I replaced. These got replaced. I replaced this piece because I had over shaded it, this piece of holly, but you know, you can strive for perfection in your artistry and I think a lot of it's, you know, there's a point uh, where uh, you need to stop. Next slide. And so that's what's left over is a bucket full of tape. You go through a ton of masking tape. I'm sorry I talk so long. When I first start talking, I'm not entirely comfortable and the comfort level just kind of picks up and so it makes me just more and more verbose, but I hope there was something in there that you guys enjoyed, even if you have no intention of doing marquetry. The last thing I want to say is Bob asked me, would we ever do a marquetry class? Um, and if people were interested and wanted to buy the supplies and build a donkey, and the supplies would be a fret saw, which is cheap, some blades, build your own donkey according to the plans, and there were maybe up to a half a dozen of us. If there were just two or three, I would be willing to do a class and we could pick a basic motif to start out with. You could practice on your own with some of the stuff that's in some of these books. And so I, I have muddled around in many different disciplines in woodworking over the past 15 years, but I enjoyed art when I was a kid tremendously and I really find that the artistry in this, if that appeals to you, even if you're a puzzler and you like to build puzzles, this is like building your own puzzle. So I'm gonna shut up and I'll entertain if anybody has questions, we're 10 after, we've already missed the Gonzaga game. Um, yes? I don't understand exactly the eight degrees. Is that facing the blade up or down, do you start so, the, so my blade is going up and down vertical with my axis. The table is tilted at eight degrees. What that allows me to do is because of the position of the background veneer and the insert piece, I'm just cutting through two pieces. When I'm beveling, it makes that bevel different for the top that I'm discarding than the bottom. So when you push that piece up in there, you have a near seamless effect especially after you glue, and you can see these cutoff pieces. So it's 90 degrees. So my saw is doing this up and down as close as possible. It doesn't have to be perfect, and I'm holding with my other hand and moving the piece, and I'm cutting in a clockwise direction. And because of the difference in the positioning of the insert piece below the background piece, those two bevels are slightly different, so they pop together. And if it's thin veneer, you got to have a much steeper to get that effect because you don't have as much surface area to bevel. Next question, or if I don't have at least one more question, I'm going to realize I was way too blabby. <laughs> Nothing else. Thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed it.